In this video, I'm doing that very British thing. I'm driving a sports car with no roof in winter. Oh, listen to that. This is the surprisingly exciting world of the MGF. One of the most underrated sports cars you can buy, which makes it very, very hub nut. So I've managed to find a very British scene to review this very British sports car. The first inklings of the MGF came about in the mid 1980s, a front wheel drive car designed by um, Jerry McGovern, who would go on to um, his currently head of styling at Land Rover. Uh, styled the Land Rover Freelander, one of my favorite cars. But the conception of this car is really quite interesting. Uh, that was the F15, F16 prototype. At the same time, MG Rover also released the EXE um, concept car. And if you look at the rear styling of the F in particular, you will see um, a very close link to that MGX EXE. Now that's why it's the F, because it effectively followed on from that. There was another mid-engine concept, the ADO 21 in the 1970s. That was the MGD to follow on from the NGC. So that's how we get to F. But there were three different projects competing uh, against each other and overseen by Rover Special Projects, um, which, or products, sorry, which um, also gave us the RSP Cooper, the Mini Cooper for the 90s was called the RSP or is known as the RSP because it was a Rover Special uh, Products um, vehicle. It then became a production model again. I'm digressing all over the place. Uh, so there's three different um, concepts. One was front wheel drive based on Maestro running gear. Another was um, conceived, um, well, it was built by Reliance. 3.9 litre Rover V8, traditional sort of a chassis going on. Your hairy chested sports car. Third one was mid-engined. And mid-engined was of interest because like the Toyota MR2, you could simply take the running gear from a front wheel drive hatchback and put it amidships and bingo, you've got your sports car. It's exactly what Rover ended up doing. They effectively used two Metro front subframes, the rear one swapped around, modified slightly because we've got different suspension going on at the back, sort of a trailing arm. And that's how it um, came to be. That It's got an empty subframe at the front, effectively, another one at the back with all the running gear in it. So a very interesting conception. And it was that rear wheel, rear engine model or mid-engined one that the management decided to go ahead on. Slightly annoying really, they were kind of missed the ball because the MX-5 came out in 1989, changed the world of sports cars forever very much announced that sports cars were no longer niche. They could be everyday cars. And the MGF obviously had to match up to that. We'll find out whether it does once we get to the driving. But uh, let's take a look around. I'll talk a bit more about the history once we get underway. The important bit is it was launched in March 1995 and um, received very, very well. We've got hydrogas suspensions. So that makes it something unique. So again, we'll get to that in the driving, but let's have a quick look around. So this is a fairly late um, MGF. You see it's on a 51 plate. Production ended in 2002, so that suggests a 2001 registration, or it could be early 2002. Uh, it's a slightly confusing setup I'm not gonna get into here. But we've still got this very cheeky front end. And while the concept of the car took shape outside Rover, uh, it was Jerry McGovern, then part of the styling team, who um, very much gave it this cute, cheeky face and I really like it. I think it's really good. We've got a grille which sort of harks back to the 1970s MGBs, um, but a lot of character. The passenger wiper is sitting a bit too low for my liking. Look, it's on the trim, so that's not quite right, but we'll forgive it that. Uh, we've got to have a British flag on it because British, these gorgeous alloy wheels, I think they're very nice as well. Uh, we've got an aftermarket luggage cover on the back mounted the correct way around because the hoopy bit is meant to stop stuff flying off when you brake hard. And uh, we'll see what sort of boot space we've got on offer in this um, very, very little sports car. But here at the back, you can clearly see the link to the um, EXE sports car, even more on the early MGF, which had smoked indicator lenses. I think these are actually TF lamps that have been fitted because this poor car, when Simon got it, had uh, Lexus rear lights fitted, and that's just not acceptable in any way or sh shape or form. Uh, we've got the old um, MG Octagon, slightly faded there but let's have a look inside 
We've got the doors open nice and wide, obviously frameless, because sports car. Very supportive, sporty bucket seats. We've got some aftermarket um, hoops, or, or maybe they're genuine, I don't know. We've also got Animal coming along for a ride out in the wind stream. But uh, we'll jump in and uh, we've got a very clear, very concise, not particularly interesting binnacle ahead. It just tells you everything you need to know. Electric mirror switch there, which you'll find in all sorts of cars and uh, indicators. Yeah, that's quite a nice indicator noise. We've got coolant temperature shown here. Oh, sorry, that's oil temperature there. Coolant temperature is here, of course, uh, a later head unit, little controls. Now these little controls are a bit annoying because I quite like to have heat to the face and to the feet and that's not possible. You can have it there, you can have it there, or you can have it there. That's not ideal, but we'll keep it on feet. Electric window switches seen in many other Rover products, but I think these switches are, are unique. A little stubby gear lever here, really nice precise action on it. That's quite funky, and uh, I even like the little MG ashtray. That looks like it's been lifted out of an MGB. There is a glove box, it's rather flimsy, and I've even had issues with it coming open while I'm driving along already, which is why some stuff is on the floor. But uh, yeah, it's quite nice in here. I've driven other Fs and felt like you sit much higher, but this feels okay. Uh, we've got the daintiest little um, sun visors you will ever see. But let's have a look elsewhere on this car. Right, does the luggage rack suggest there is no boot space? Often the problem on mid-engine cars? No, not really. There's a decent amount of space here, decent depth. Um, we've got one of Simon's legendary dinosaurs, they appear in every test. See also the Rover 414 and the Metro. Uh, I see he's had to apply some sealant around the rear lights. Very common on Rover products. My Rover 75 suffers the same. Uh, under these flaps we can see a hint of engine. It's not looking the easiest engine to work on. I think you can get to it this side and also I think you can remove the hood and get access under here as well. So uh, that is the downside of a mid-engine car. The engine is not quite as you'd expect. Um, I'm surprised to see it this way around. I was thinking if it was a Metro subframe the engine might be sitting on the other side if it's just been swapped around but I guess it just goes to prove it isn't just a straight lift. Uh, can we lift this one as well? Oh, that one doesn't want to come up. We'll leave that one where it is. But yeah, 1.8 litre K-series engine. This is the non-VVC, 118 brake horsepower. Uh, the variable valve control version had 143. And the MGF was the first use of the 1.8 litre engine. Got a bonnet release here for the front, so I'm just gonna pull that. So that's the front cover and we'll see what's under there. Aha, so now we've found the spare wheel. The radiator is also here at the front. Screen wash as well. Oddly, we've got a remote servo. Um, there must be a cross linkage. Uh, it's interesting that it didn't fit here. Uh, I wonder what's under there. But nonetheless, we've got the um, brake master cylinder on the passenger side of the vehicle. Very clean under here. Battery as well for a bit of weight distribution. And uh, that's all we can see of the radiator. And uh, that can be a problem on these cars. Uh, they can suffer a bit on the cooling system um, because we've got that K-series engine, which we will discuss in a moment, and you've got such a long pipe run. can be very tricky to bleed mid-engine cars because you can imagine you've got pipes running all the way front to back. Uh, the pipes can rot out for extra fun, extra lols as well. But I think we've done enough talking. I think we should probably do a little more driving. Just before we set off, there is the important business of the wiper test. So we'll give it some wash and uh, some flick and yeah, unsurprisingly we're getting a very mild triangle of doom going on just here uh, because that passenger blade is what mounted, or well, the arm rather, is a bit low. But a nice pattern, I think, goes nice and close to this end. We've got a mist function, but annoyingly, as on many Rovers, you have to twist to go through the different wiper settings, which personally I find a mild annoyance. Um, lights are over this side. Right, let's fire that K-series engine into life. There we go, it's quite odd having a very familiar K-series noise coming from behind me. Um, but we'll talk a bit about the K-series just before we launch off. Uh, K-series, it, it is an engine with a somewhat checkered history. I talked about it a bit in my test of a Rover 414 R8 and said that the head gasket issues are a bit overstated. 
Amusingly, that car blew its head gasket a few weeks later, but to be fair, so did another friend's 416 with a Honda engine. I think in older cars, head gasket issues are a problem. I will say the MGF, the 1.8, they had to Siamese the cylinders to um, get the capacity out of the um, block. They couldn't make the block any larger. So it's that, and a, combined with a longer stroke makes the 1.8 litre engine, and they later did a 1.6 with a shorter stroke. As they enlarge the engine, it did start creating problems. So head gaskets can be an issue. But it's worth remembering, um, Lotus used the K-Series engine to very good effect in the Elise, also mid-engined. And um, I, I think there's a lot to be done with proper, decent head gaskets, the MLS head gaskets, also a bit of care. Uh, one of the best things you can do to an MGF, this one doesn't have one, I don't think, is fit an aftermarket low coolant sensor. Because with such a long pipe run, if you lose any coolant it's going to be catastrophic but nonetheless enough waffle more driving oh yeah oh, ho, ho. that's a very lovely noise i think a k-series on full chat is um an excellent sounding four-cylinder engine and because it's a 1.8 We've got a decent amount of mid-range shove as well, so it's not all top-end zingy power. The VVC's a bit more that way inclined. Slow down for these um, pedestrians, and then we get back on the enjoyment pedal again. So it's not ridiculously quick. We're closing in on 60, and I'm gonna slow down for a bend. The power steering is unnecessary and too light. It doesn't inspire confidence. But this is, oh, do you think how good an MGB sounds? The MGB, a car I'm a little tedious of, just because I had to write about them so much when I was in the classic car media. But an amazing engine note, and this car has that in abundance. It sounds incredible. I love the noise. So yeah, this, this feels like I'm living the British sports car dream here. This is what it's all about. The ride is a little on the firm side for the Hydra gas, but I think that's just because it gives better handling control and it does seem very good. A very balanced chassis tends towards understeer rather than oversteer to make it safer. So some people complain that means it's not very edgy. It's not as much fun as an MX-5. You can coax the back end out on an MX-5 very readily and that is part of their appeal. But you have to remember, these cars weren't just made for enthusiasts. They were made for ordinary people who just wanted a bit of that um, open top excitement that a sports car gives you. And uh, I think fair play for ensuring you don't have something that's too niche, that's too um, sports car orientated. I think the MGF also suffers from that cutesy front end. I think people make the mistake of thinking it's therefore not very capable. I'm loving that noise. So the VVC was very much um, Rover's answer to Honda's VTEC. That variable valve timing that makes them absolute screamers. The non-VVC cars have slightly taller gearing because there's no, they haven't got the same need to keep them fizzing away. Um, so I think for my money, I would rather have the non-VVC. I'm having plenty of fun without actually going all that quickly. But yeah, there's an abundance of grip. It feels very secure. It's just that this electronic power steering rather robs the car of feel. So you don't have the confidence going into the bends. You're just not quite sure what's going on at the front. Oh! Oh! 60! Yeah, it's not stupid quick, but that noise is utterly, utterly addictive. And now we're doing just over two and a half thousand revs at 60. So it can be the refined cruiser as well, if you so wish. But you, unlike an MX-5, you don't necessarily feel you have to treat this car any differently. An MX-5, you have to be mindful of the fact that it is rear wheel drive. I don't think you do in this. And some might see that as boring, but in a road car, 
you want safe, predictable handling, I'm afraid. And uh, that's really what you want more than anything, is to know and expect what the car's going to do. You don't want it doing, you don't want it surprising you. That's really not um, what you want in a road car. If you're going on track, then yeah, the edgier chassis makes for a better handling experience. That's why a Lotus Elise, same engine, same layout, uh, is a lot more fun because they do feel edgy and you do have to control them and uh, you do have to make sure you don't do something daft to upset it. But now we're on a slightly smoother road, the suspension is really coming into its own because that hydrogas suspension designed by Dr. Alex Moulton and uh, first seen on the Allegro, the hydrogas, is interlinked front to rear. Uh, hydrogas follows on from the hydrolastic, uh, but the hydrogas, as the name suggests, introduces nitrogen gas uh, as an extra medium there to give um, better damping, more progressive damping. And uh, yeah, I, I can kind of feel the suspension working, but it's not choppy, which is um, what you might expect in a car of fairly short wheelbase. But it's a lovely driving position and uh, the heater's working well. I might turn it up a couple of um, fan settings. It, it just proves how much the um, Brits can do. We have a reputation for not being able to build cars properly, but I think the F um, is definitely one of the highlights of the British motoring era. Once again, developed on a fairly small budget, as was always the way, but somehow they created a great handling, very enjoyable car, but is, perfectly acceptable for everyday use. You could drive this car every day and not really feel you are being hard done by. I'm not sure the same is true of an MGB necessarily. This feels more comfortable, more cosseting. We won't necessarily at the cost of um, handling. Well, I'd just pull over just to talk about the hood, which we shall flip over like so. So there we go. So we've got a plastic rear window and a couple of little clips here on the front, but latch it in, all nice and secure. And uh, just shut that door. It's a bit harder now, there's um, actual air pressure inside the car. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite a pretty hood. And one of the reasons for that is the hood is the only thing that isn't British. The hood was designed by Pininfarina. Now I feel properly British. I have um, driven this British sports car roof down in the winter. And uh, the heater is absolutely top notch, uh, very, very pleasing. And actually you do get heat out of the face vents, even when you've got it set to feet. So that's all good. So a very enjoyable car, very underrated. Simon paid 700 pounds for this car. He has had to do some improvement work, getting rid of those awful Lexus rear lights, um, painting the mirror housings and generally cleaning it up a bit. But yeah, this seems an outrageous car for the money. It's a lot of fun to the pound. So I hope you've enjoyed my road test of this MGF. Thank you for watching and I will see you in a future video. I'm going for a drive.